Uh, Sujata's work is characterized by an equal dedication to crime victim, to crime survivors and people who've caused harm. A former victim advocate and public defender, Sujata spent the past 15 years practicing and co-creating restorative justice solutions to mass criminalization, most recently as the director of Impact Justice Restorative Justice Project. She speaks publicly and inside prisons about her own experiences as a survivor of child sexual abuse and rape and her path to forgiveness. Sujata was named a 2019 MacArthur Fellow, and we can be certain that Sujata's faith journey undergirds all of her work, her justice work. So please join me in welcoming Sujata Baliga. Thank you so much. It's such a blessing and an honor to be here. Uh, Thank you, Calcasa, for this kind invitation. I'm going to invite us all. I know there's been a lot of listening this morning, so um, it'll be beneficial. It'll be beneficial to me uh, if we all just take a moment to take a collective breath. Uh, for those of you who are sitting for a long period of time, to stretch in whatever way is most comfortable uh, for you, uh, that is kind to your body uh, and and your spirit right now. Um, and just to, to remember that we have bodies and that we are living in them right now. And it's a good reminder for me as well uh, at this moment. So again, thank you uh, so much uh, for this invitation to join you today. And thanks to all who are listening under these uh, less than ideal circumstances. I really love these conferences because uh, of the juicy conversations, not just getting to hear wonderful speakers and engage in panels and uh, workshops, but um, for those juicy conversations that happen in the break and in the intercessions, uh, those heart connections, uh, the new ideas that start to percolate, the, uh, huh, uh, I'm not sure that really resonated with me, um, or um, uh, that's my learning edge. So it seems uh, particularly important during a conference uh, asking us to imagine and make bold moves uh, that you'll take some time to do this, uh, maybe through the course of the day, if you can, uh, with others, by phone, by text, um, or in the days that weeks and weeks that follow uh, this conference. So as someone who's gotten to spend quite a bit of time with Indigenous people the world over, I've been taught to share first a bit about who I am before speaking. Um, because it reminds me uh, to whom and what I owe my ideas, uh, experiences, and my flourishing. And because it gives you context uh, for, who, for what you'll hear from me. Right, so today I very much speak as myself, a child of immigrants who lived in rural, politically and socially conservative Pennsylvania in the 1970s and 80s. Uh, we come from a people who were colonized both by the British and until 1961 by the Portuguese as well, who brutally occupied parts of India long after British rule of India ended. And while living with those and other multiple oppressions, my family lineage also benefited from unearned caste privilege, as I do to this day. I also speak to you as a survivor of sexual violence of childhood sexual abuse by my father, of campus sexual assault, and later in my life, of rape. I come humbly as someone who has caused harm in my life, both from leveraging my place in the structural oppressions that at times benefit me and at times do not, and as someone who's caused more direct and even intentional harm to others. And I come to you as someone who deeply loves people who have caused unthinkable harms, including the harms that were done to me. I learned much from my years as a victim advocate in both rape crisis and domestic violence contexts, as well as from my years as a public defender. There are too many teachers to name in my allotted time, but I offer them all a deep, deep bow. And more than anything, I'm someone who is profoundly grateful to the Tibetan masters who have kept the teachings of the Buddha alive when they were lost to my homeland, and to the indigenous and Mennonite people who've taught me everything I know about restorative justice. 
So I've spent the past couple of decades learning about and doing my best to practice restorative justice. And because so much of the wisdom that I have uh, because of this now and the experiences and the practices come from Indigenous people, I must also take a moment to acknowledge that I'm speaking to you from occupied land. My home sits on Indigenous territory that was never ceded by the Chichonio and Ohlone people. In the aftermath of the missions that resulted in their landlessness, the remaining Chichonio merged with the Muwekma Ohlone tribe, which represents all known surviving American Indian lineages, lineages which used to flourish here in the San Francisco Bay Area. Muwekma means the people. They petitioned the federal, for federal recognition of their tribal, tribal status and they lost and filed an appeal in 2012. So let's take a breath together as we acknowledge this cruel, unjust, and as yet unresolved truth and our role in the continuation of it and our obligation to work towards justice for indigenous people on the soil we live off of on the lands we occupy. And before I, I keep going, I wanna just uh, be mindful of the way in which I use the word our and we and who I exclude and who I include when I say that. And just uh, to note that when I just said these words, um, I wasn't acknowledging uh, that there are indigenous people listening today. Um, and so, um, so I'll be more mindful if I can as I continue to speak about when I say the word our and we and uh, who is included in that and who is excluded. So I've been asked to answer this question at this particular moment in time. What bold moves should we be taking to end sexual violence? So again, I can only speak for myself, and my hope is that in my sharing, you'll consider which of these you might want to lean into or what starts to sing in your heart um, that might move you to a deeper contemplation and even actions that will be beneficial to all of us. So a few years ago, I had this incredible blessing of being in a year-long program called Leading from the Inside Out, which is a part of the Rockwood Leadership Institute. And I made some incredible heart comrades from various fields and really started to deepen uh, cross-movement work in my life um, based on that year. Um, and one of the things that we learned in that year uh, and what Rockwood teaches is that for lasting transformative change to occur, uh, change needs to happen on three fronts, uh, hearts and minds, behaviors, and structures. Hearts and minds, behaviors, and structures. And so it's sort of like a rubber band, like when we're trying to change things. If you pull too far in one direction without sort of um, helping it stretch in all directions, uh, it's just going to snap back. Um, and so, um, so, so my, my efforts are to always be thinking about sort of all three of those things. Uh, my own tendency is more towards hearts and minds, a little bit behaviors and then structures. Um, and, and this next phase of my life, I think, is more around hearts and minds um, as I step back a little bit more from the structural work. But I think it's really important to consider all three. And in that work, I um, bring two lenses to this. One is as a Buddhist and one as a restorative justice practitioner. So I'm thinking about bold moves on these three fronts. Let's start with hearts and minds. For me, a bold move has been uh, decolonizing to the best that I can my, whole, my own heart and mind um, in terms of what it means uh, to, so decolonizing means removing this binary view of us and them and really understanding that oppression has been possible through divide and conquer which at its base requires us to view someone else as the other, someone as the enemy, someone as competition. Uh, and we see this in our movement work and we see this in the work um, that we do more broadly and in our everyday existence, or at least I do in mine. So the bold move of my life has really been a paradigm shift in the way in which I think about harm and wrongdoing and violence. Howard Zare, one of my teachers in the field of restorative justice, frames this paradigm shift in, in this way. He talks about the three questions. So restorative justice, instead of asking what law was broken, who broke it, and how should they be punished, uh, we ask instead, who was harmed? What do they need? And whose obligation is it to meet those needs? 
And in so doing, we really center survivors and engaging those who've harmed and the community to meet survivor self-identified needs. And when we deepen that process, we really look at root causes and the structural um, setup that produces these harms without uh, taking away the opportunity for accountability from those who have caused harm. So in, in a sense, this is holding too true the simultaneously that those who cause harm must be accountable, uh, which is not the same thing as punishment. Um, and that as my Maori friends from Aotearoa, also known as New Zealand say, uh, there's this word mana, which is about your life force, your dignity, uh, that that mana must be intact or increased through the process for everyone in the process. Uh, no matter what they've done, they are human and their mana, their life force, their dignity, their standing in the community must also be increased. Um, so in my hearts and minds uh, work, uh, that while I would like to abolish, uh, and I am working towards abolishing the entire criminal legal system, ideally, uh, we see some major progress in this in my lifetime and, 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 in, the, and in the future um, after, after my life. Um, and, and as well as racialized mass criminalization, um, my work on this individual hearts and minds uh, level is to abolish the police that live in my heart. And I'm deeply moved by the calls to imagine a world in which we cause no additional harm as we seek to end sexual harm and violence. Uh, and when I came to understand that prison does nothing to end sexual violence, but simply relocates sexual violence to cages, this realization required me to imagine another way. Um, and I'll get to that when I talk about structures briefly in a bit. Um, and, and to really imagine this from a place of this word Ubuntu, uh, it's a Bantu word that means I am because we are, or a person is a person through other people. And another way I think about this is through interdependence or for what Thich Nhat Hanh calls interbeing. Interbeing. We inter are. It's quite bold really to open our hearts to the fact that we inter are not just with those who have lifted us and held us in their compassion and loved us and treated us with dignity and respect, but with those who have fallen from that who have done things that, if even for a time, have broken us, and in so doing, have broken themselves and broken the community. So this is no easy lift, and I encourage people to really breathe and sit with this, um, with gentleness and tenderness as we hold this possibility in our hearts and minds. On the front of behaviors, um, a, a bold move for this community might be um, changing the language we use. So, during my years as a public defender, I met many people who had, um, so I was a victim advocate and then I was a public defender, right? And so I met many people when I was a public defender who had suffered unthinkable trauma in their lives, uh, lives that um, don't want to play trauma Olympics, but really made my childhood look like a cakewalk. And I don't say this to excuse the things that they did, um, but rather to understand that they were as much survivors as I was, and they did not lose their status as survivors when they caused harm. Um, and so it made no sense to me to relegate them to the box that I had previously put them in. I used to call these people rapists and abusers and perpetrators. Um, and so over the years, I have come to remove all of these labels from my language. And I wish I knew who to give this credit to, but I recently heard uh, that someone spoke at the annual conference for the Association for the Treatment of Sexual Abusers, uh, who said, why do we keep calling people by the thing we want them to stop doing? So in a sense, to my mind, labels leave us fixed in time. And I've noticed that a lot of indigenous people don't use labels in their language, particularly the word offender. Uh, Justice Robert Yazzie, the former Chief Justice of the Navajo Nation and a heart mentor of mine, says that instead of the, the word offender, uh, in Diné, his, his mother tongue, uh, the, the phrase is acting as if you have no family. Acting as if they have no family. Um, how deeply does this apply to my father, right? What would have been required for him uh, to help him remember and behave as if he were acting uh, deeply connected to his multi-generational family, including to me, to behave as if I were his daughter. 
Um, in the Restorative Justice Listening Project report, uh, co-authored by my wonderful friend Sonia Shah, sister survivor and brilliant restorative justice practitioner, um, she quotes uh, Faith Tate from the Nizga Nation, who says, we, have a, we don't have a word for offender in our language. The word we use means unhealed. So I think we reify our beliefs by using certain words. So I warm, warmly encourage you to try to avoid them uh, and try instead to say people who, people who have raped. I'm not trying to take away the rape, to be clear. I am trying to say that they are people who have raped, the person who raped me. Um, and again, and to be gentle as we lean into this, um, but for a while, see if that increases your belief that we might actually live in a world someday free from sexual violence and harm, because for violence to end, people must change. And so the next uh, piece that I'd like to share with you briefly is sort of a deeper challenge. Um, and that is to, if that wasn't enough, <laughs> to get proximate with those who've caused harm. I really love how Brian Stevenson talks about this word to get proximate, that this is a challenge to us to get proximate. Um, for survivors out there, this is not an easy task, you know, but I, I myself have learned some of the most valuable things. And I want to just add briefly that um, some of us are proximate, right? Some of us don't have uh, the uh, luxury to not, um, to not uh, be in contact with those who have caused us harm, right? Um, and so that's not the kind of proximate I mean, but like a purposeful engagement uh, for a very specific purpose. Um, to engage with folks who have used violence, who've used sexual violence. Some of the most valuable things I've learned, learned comes from acknowledging the humanity uh, of those who've caused harm and are willing to make amends. Uh, they know far better than I do why people sexually violate others. Uh, who better uh, than them to, to help us find a way to end it, right? I am very tired of survivors being asked to solve this. And so for me, uh, it's been challenging, but also strangely refreshing, or maybe not strangely, to sit down with those who have done what was done to me and to ask, what happened? What would have made you not do this? Uh, you give me the answers. That is your work to do, not mine. And I will be here with you while you do that work because that work will benefit me and all of us. So finally, I wanna just briefly touch on structures. Uh, what structures need to exist to create a world where harm is prevented, resolved, healed, without causing additional harm, especially the additional harm that is done by the state uh, and harm that lands disproportionately on black and brown bodies. When the legitimacy of arguments um, uh, that we deserve to live free from sexual violence have been tied to our alignment, to our alignment with the criminal legal system. It is quite bold to say that the criminal legal system has been an abject failure. I know that this may cause certain advocates out there some fear, right? This fear of losing funding, this fear of losing credibility, but it is time to admit that billions and trillions of dollars have been spent on something that is an abject failure and actively harms communities of color, those who've caused harm, and survivors, right? It is rife with racial disparities, soaring recidivism rates, and with the survivors on the sidelines, our needs never centered and rarely, if ever, met. How do we build then a thing we want to see, the thing we imagine from this place of Ubuntu, um, while the massive machine that is the criminal legal system and things like uh, CPS and others that operate in specifically racialized ways continue to operate the way they do. Uh, so my work in restorative justice um, has been over the years helping communities build decolonized ways of doing this uh, to circumvent the criminal legal system. I'm really grateful for my years at Impact Justice and the incredible work that we did together there uh, and really excited to see how that work continues uh, under the leadership of Ashley George on the youth diversion context. Um, and I also am doing some work now uh, off the grid in nascent ways where survivors of intimate and sexual um, intimate and sexual partner violence can reach out directly for restorative justice facilitation when they cannot contact the state or when they choose to not contact the state, uh, that this needs to be made available. Uh, I myself never contacted the state 
right? I didn't want my father locked up. I didn't want potential immigration consequences for my family. I didn't want to be taken away and put in a family that didn't practice my religion, my, speak my language, eat my food. Um, and so like so many, like the vast majority of survivors, particularly survivors of color, uh, the state was not on offer for me. This is in part why we have to envision other ways. So, you know, Another sort of bold move at the structural level, and again, something to lean into, is that in 2001, I started to use my voice as a survivor to say not in my name, testifying against laws that increase criminal penalties. When I do this, I am often asked, aren't you testifying for the wrong side? Uh, didn't you want to be sitting on that side of, um, of the courtroom or that side of, of this hearing hall? Um, so this isn't an easy position to be in. Um, but I do regularly do this. Um, I am often the only survivor sitting there. Um, but I know that by doing this, I live in line with my commitment to nonviolence uh, and to my desire to end all forms of coercion and abuse. So again, I just really wanna thank you for listening. I know I've gone a little bit over time here, um, but thank you for considering my words. Uh, bold moves really require stretching ourselves in new, directions. Um, and I really encourage us to be kind to ourselves as we find a place that really occupies both radical self-care and an understanding that none of us are free until all of us are free. Thank you very much.